Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast, a Canadian real estate podcast that shows you how to pay off your mortgage sooner and live well while doing it. Now, here's your host, Sean Cooper. Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. I'm Sean Cooper, and it's great to be back for another episode. On today's show, I'll be talking to Rizwan Malik. Rizwan is a realtor to reckon with, becoming the youngest VP of sales at Sotheby's International Realty Canada in the company's history, along with his credit as a host of HGTV's Hot Market, Rizwan is fueled with passion, knowledge, and intimate desire to help people. In my interview with Rizwan, we discuss why buying a home makes sense even with 5% down, how he became a TV host on HGTV, and COVID-19's continued effect on the real estate market. Without further ado, here's my interview with Rizwan Malik. Hi Rizwan, how are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very flattered. Great. Well, looking forward to discussing some interesting topics today, especially with the whole COVID situation. It would be interesting to get your perspective being a realtor yourself. So let's jump into the first question. Can you explain why getting into the housing market sooner rather than later is important for new prospective home buyers? Absolutely. And, I, and this is the conversation I have with a lot of my friends. I mean, I'm, I'm still fairly young. I'm just in my mid-30s and I, and I started selling real estate when I was only 20 years old. So I've been doing this long enough and I've seen the changes in our marketplace and I've seen how prices have completely skyrocketed and I've benefited personally from that as well. And it's, it's one of those things where if you don't start now or if you don't try your best to get into the housing market today, you're basically racing against the clock and you're bidding against yourself. Sometimes I'll have buyers that I'll start working with and just because they want to make sure that they're going to get their the, the biggest bang for their buck, or they're going to get the absolute best property possible, they'll take several months. And I had one client just took almost a year to purchase. This person was also a friend of mine, so I didn't mind. It was more of a conversation. It was more of, it was fun to go out hunting for places and it was, it was less business, more pleasure. And I don't have a very pushy salesman type of approach to buying or selling real estate. It's more like hey, you'll do it at your pace, which you know has its benefits, but I will always nudge along. So in this particular case, it took us almost about a year to find a place because this individual wanted to take as long as they wanted. And unfortunately for them, by the time they settled on a property, it was very similar to one of the first few properties or first few condos that I had shown them. The only difference is that same property had appreciated almost $60,000 in value. But had they made that decision sooner, had they made that decision realizing based on their budget, they could have just purchased the condo then, not only would they have benefited from buying it for about $60,000 less, the course of the year that we spent looking for this property, they could have also been paying down their mortgage and they themselves would have benefited with the $60,000 appreciation. It's multifaceted, like entering the, the housing market ASAP or as soon as you're able to, I'm a huge advocate for that. You need to do whatever you possibly can to get there. Yeah, that's a great point that you raised. Certainly you can't see whole prices moving up when you're looking for a property like myself when I was searching for my first home. I ended up looking for two and a half years and it wasn't my choice. It was just the market was so competitive in the areas that I wanted to buy. It just took me that long to buy a property. But certainly I, I could totally attest to the fact that I noticed that suddenly a, a property that I was able to afford last year that cost like, I don't know, let's say 350 had gone up to 425. I could certainly see the difference in, in price. I, I totally agree with you. The sooner that you get into the market, the better. Certainly, you should make sure that you have all your ducks in a row and speak with a mortgage broker and have them run the numbers for you. But once you're financially ready and it makes sense for you, I certainly think it, it's a good idea to get into the market. And I have clients sometimes that are reading the news headlines. I mean, do you have clients yourself that are like, oh, the 
newspaper says there's going to be a huge housing correction. I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and wait for that. <laughs> if I had have listened to those experts, I wouldn't have bought in 2012 and my house that I bought for 425, I would have to pay 900,000 for these days. Sean, for in the last 14 years, I'm still waiting for that bubble to burst. <laughs> like it's, it, it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, it, it's one of those things like even with this global pandemic, even with this, um, with everything that's happening right now, I mean, we are seeing certain segments of the market are still flourishing. We're still seeing double digit increases all across the country, like not, you know, not just in Ontario, but like we're seeing it all over the country, like coast to coast. But the other thing you're also seeing the segments of the market that are currently not benefiting from this or are, are hurting are the, the rent, condo rental market. It's not doing so well. And just the condo market itself in general right now, because, you know, th with this whole global pandemic and people understanding that maybe they may never go back to work, maybe it'll be work from home indefinitely. Maybe there'll be half a week, they'll be from home and half a week from the office. People are understanding that their needs are changing. People are understanding that their their requirements are going to change. So now they want a home office. Or let's say if we go into a second or a third or a fourth wave or whatever it might be, this 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 virus mutates into different things. The unknown, right? So people are starting to make very permanent changes about their living arrangements where they're thinking, you know what, even if I had a small townhouse, 45 minutes or an hour outside the city, that's okay because I'd rather have a backyard. In the summer months, I'd rather work off a little picnic table in my backyard or a patio set rather than inside, the, inside from, from, the, from my 500 square foot condo, right? So it, 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 the conversation has changed. So because of that, people's mindset has, has slightly changed with the conversation changing. And it's, it's, uh, it's getting them to understand that, okay, you know what, maybe that 500 square foot pied a tear or our primary residence in the city isn't it. So this is what's causing that sort of decline in prices or definitely in demand. Like, you know, just a few, just, a, just in the last few weeks, I was out showing a, showing a property to somebody and, you know, she came highly recommended by one of my very, very close and dear friends from university. So we were out looking at, looking at condos and she finally settled on a one bedroom plus den. This exact same unit earlier this year in June, not renovated, I'll add, sold for 700,000. And we thought, wonderful. We were able to pick up a mirror, a mirror copy, a mirror layout of that same exact floor plan and of that unit, and also slightly renovated for six hundred and thirty-five thousand. Oh, wow! So you know, my client's already ahead, not only by sixty-five thousand, but she's already ahead almost a hundred thousand if you factor in the renovation. It's not a bad time to get into the condo market if that's your goal. Having said that, you know, as, as many people are understanding that their needs are changing, they, they, they'd rather be in a position where they, they might want some outdoor space, they might want a designated office area. But I think for a huge segment of the market, their decision is very much location driven. So if you're, look, if you're location conscious and that's what you're looking for, at the end of the day, like if you want to be downtown, then a condo is a way to go. Like I live in a condo. It's, it's quite nice. I, once I moved in, I renovated and I made it my own because I realized that I wasn't going to move from here for quite some time. Everyone's needs are different, but I think more and more people are starting to realize that they might want some space, some extra space. Great. Well, you've convinced me about the benefits of buying now. So let's say somebody actually goes and wants to buy a property now, what are some steps that they can take to save up for a home now? That really hasn't changed in a while, right? Like my whole thing is, if, you're, if you are a first time buyer, there are many different programs that are available to you, right? Like I, and you can speak to your broker, speak to your mortgage broker and, and your lender and find out what it is that you are able to achieve. So whether it's just even by putting as little as 5% on a portion of your mortgage and 10% on the rest down, it's a great way to get in. I mean, I think one of the other huge, hugely misunderstood topics when it comes to insured mortgages, you know, the Canada Housing Mortgage Corporation has uh, insured mortgages through CMHC and you have to pay the premium. And I never say take on extra debt if you don't have to, but sometimes there is such a thing as good debt. And in my opinion, getting into the housing market sooner rather than later, even if you have to pay the CMHC premium, is beneficial. I always have this conversation with clients and I say, hey, listen, give me an example. Because it's one of those things where they're willing to borrow 
200, 300, 400 thousand dollars. But when it comes to an extra 10 thousand dollars in mortgage insurance, oh yeah, yeah, we can't do that. Well, why? What difference does it make? Whether if your mortgage is 200 thousand or 210 thousand or 400 thousand and 415 thousand, it doesn't really affect you. However, what it does is it allows you to get into the housing market that much faster. It allows you to pay down your mortgage instead of throwing away money in rent. And it allows you to benefit from market appreciation. I mean, you're, it's, it's such a, it's a no brainer type of decision for me because on the flip side of things, let's say if you want to get to that you know, optimal 20% down where you won't require the, the CMHC insurance, I quite blank ask my clients and I say, okay, so you're, you're right now sitting at about 10% down great. And let's say they're looking for a $500,000 place. They have $50,000 saved. How much longer will it take you to save the extra 50,000? Is it going to be a month? Is it going to be a year, two years, three years, four years? And in often cases, they'll say two to three years. And my issue there is fine. Two to three years during those two to three years, you are renting a property let's say if you're downtown Toronto or even in outskirts, we'll go with a very modest amount of $1,000 a month, you're willing to part with or throw away 24 to 36,000 over the next two to three years, but you're not willing to take on an extra 10 to $15,000 in mortgage insurance premium. I mean, it makes no sense to me at all. No, you're, you're preaching to the choir. That certainly is a, a good argument. And yes, uh, as you're mentioning also, home prices can easily appreciate depending on the market that you're in and the property that you're interested in, it could go up thirty, forty thousand dollars a year and for you to be able to save that amount of money if, remember these are after tax dollars that you're putting towards the down payment unless you put it in the RSP but spending ten thousand dollars in CMHC mortgage default insurance now rather than buying a property when the home prices are up thirty dollars to $40,000, I think is kind of a no brainer. Like certainly I wouldn't recommend that anyone rush in before they're financially ready. You should have the appropriate amount of savings and a contingency fund. Like if something goes wrong with the property, like when your appliances break down, it's certainly good to have some money set aside so that you don't put every penny towards the property. But yes, you won't get any argument from me. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah. And of course, and that's also the, you know, it's part of the learning curve, right? I mean, it goes from Let's say at the end of the day, like I, you know, you, you purchase your first home and you're, it's, it's a difference between maybe not eating out every single day or maybe not ordering it every single day and maybe a couple nights you'll have to cook at home or it makes that difference. And let's say the fridge breaks down or you have a repair that comes up that needs attending to, well, you're going to get that repair done first, right? And if it means you're not going to go out for that weekend or you're not going to, I mean, this year has been very different, but <laughs> in a regular time when there isn't a you know, global pandemic ensuing, then you stay home or you stay in and you put on a pot of boiling water, throw in some pasta, throw in some tomato sauce, and, 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 you, and you make do with that and you get your fridge repaired or whatever it needs to, need, needs to happen. But I think over the next two to three years that you could have just spent time saving the balance of your 20% to put down, your, your property could have appreciated $120,000, right? So yeah, I, I, I think we're, we're both on the same page there. Yes, definitely. So switching gears for a moment, you have a very interesting story. You bought your first home at age 24. And gosh, I thought I was ambitious at buying, uh, buying my first home at age 27, but you beat me by three years. So how did you accomplish <laughs> this impressive feat? Well, like I said, I, I started selling real estate at 20, at age 20, and I, I, I was saving and I was doing all sorts of things. And I thought, you know what, one of the best ways, you know, you have to practice what you preach. You can't go out there and like tell people, oh, you know, this is what you need to do. This is what I recommend. You should buy a home. That's the, the, ben the benefits of home ownership and all sorts of things. If you yourself aren't necessarily a homeowner and, and, and back then, and I'm so grateful that I did what I did before. I still own this property. It's located in the region of Peel in Brampton. As part of my savings, I, was, I, I went out to the banks and I said, hey, listen, like I, I need a mortgage. And back then, believe it or not, like this is you know, a number of years ago, and uh, over I, at this point, a decade ago, and the highest mortgage that I was able to qualify for was $250,000. And this property was $322,000. I'd come up with 72,000 to put that down. Also my closing costs, my 
uh, land transfer taxes. Now, I, the property was located in 905, so therefore I didn't necessarily have to pay the double land transfer taxes, both to the province and the municipality, like you do in downtown Toronto. And I benefited from being a first time buyer. So, but regardless, I had to come up with almost $80,000 on my own to be able to afford this place. I, I, and I managed to pull it off. Like it was like, you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. But like I said, it's one of those things where um, it's very important to do. And you prioritize certain things. And for me at that point, home ownership was the biggest priority because I was going out there and selling people that Kool-Aid that you know, home, home ownership works, it's the best thing you can do. And I'm so grateful that I did. And that same home today is worth over a million dollars. Wow, it's an amazing story. And like you said, it certainly makes sense to practice what you preach. You seem a lot more authentic. It, it's like, for example, if you're taking marriage counseling advice from somebody who is divorced, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. It makes yeah. you seem more trustworthy and authentic with your clients. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and like I said, I have a very relaxed approach when it comes to buying or selling real estate anyways. Like when you're on the market to sell, there's, there's nothing relax. There, there isn't a relaxed approach then, but I just mean, I, I allow people to arrive at their decision on their, like within their own time or whenever, whenever they want to, or however they want to. I'm not a pushy sales guy, but at, so at the same time, like this just gives grit to what I'm doing. You bought your first property and now you're a successful realtor and you have your own TV show as well on HGTV. Maybe you could just tell the listeners a bit about HGTV Canada's hot market and how you became the host of the show. That would be a quite interesting story to share with the listeners. Absolutely. So a few years ago, I, I think in about 2018, I, I received a call from a production a associate producer at architect films at the time and and they've now rebranded to nikki ray media and i just and it was like you know we're thinking we're we're currently casting for an upcoming reality-based tv show it's going to go on hgtv which is you know a marquee network canada's largest and at first i thought it was this was a joke or you know it was just someone maybe a friend of mine pulling my leg and so I entertained it. I thought, you know what, it's okay. What, what's the worst that'll happen? So then we, we got on some Skype calls and we had some media, inter like some, some interviews and stuff like that. And lo and behold, a few months later, I got a call and said, hey, listen, the show has been greenlit and you're part of the cast of Final Five. I was like, and I still couldn't really believe it until the day we showed up at Chorus and Chorus Media down on Queen's Key. And I'm like, okay, this is actually happening this is very serious this is very real and then we started filming last year over the course of last summer we filmed most of the show and the season was completed and then it aired this year both on HGTV and on Slice and and the show's done tremendously well like it's, it's been enjoyed by by the audience and I've received a lot of wonderful notes on how much the show is great and was much needed in our Canadian airways, so to speak. Like we don't, we have nothing that's sort of similar to that. And, and it's great in the sense that, you know, it's a show that encompasses everything. So there's like a renovation component. There is a buying story and a selling story. So each episode is very different, but it's again, very structured in the sense that whenever you tune in, you'll get a bit of everything. So you'll get tips on how to improve your home. It, it is a luxury based real estate television show however some of the tips and tricks that you get you're able to bring them home into your home no matter what price point you're at so and it's really really good and for those for those of you who've kind of missed watching hot market it's still available on the global tv app or with stack tv through amazon prime so it's it, it, it's a fun it's a fun show and it's, it's lighthearted and it's great and you get to tour some pretty uh, exceptional homes that sounds amazing. But certainly be sure to check it out. And are there some helpful tips for first time home buyers who aren't yet ready to buy that luxury property? Not necessarily first time home buyers. I mean, I, I, I mean, we do feature some homes that are, I think the least expensive property on there is about 1.6, 1.7 million. And then, it, and it goes up from there to tens of millions of dollars. But I think, I think what it, what like some of the takeaway from the show for example, there, there's a property that I have that I, I do staging for a very good client of mine who's a very good friend of mine. And it just, it puts things into perspective, right? So someone watching, even if they're looking for the first time, they'll realize the benefits of looking beyond the clutter or looking beyond what's within the four walls and seeing how they will live in those walls. So I, I, think, I think there's definitely takeaway for everyone, no matter where you are in your real estate journey. 
yes, definitely looking beyond the four walls is a great tip there. The, ho the home might not be the best showing property, but if it has good bones, then it certainly can be a good investment. Great advice there. So on the topic of luxury homes, can you tell the listeners what has happened in the luxury home market with the whole pandemic situation? You mentioned earlier about certain segments of the market not performing so well. Like maybe you could talk about how luxury homes have performed versus how other segments have performed. Like my understanding, and I'm not a realtor, but my understanding is that the downtown condo market has really t taken a hit right now. Like certainly I see that recovering in the future, but just would be interested to hear your thoughts on what's been going on with luxury homes versus downtown condos, which I guess are, are luxury as well, and other segments of the market, like how they've been affected versus COVID. And I've heard certain segments like cottage country seems to be red hot and, and single family homes like outside the downtown core seem to be doing well, but just be interested to hear your thoughts on how the pandemics like reshape the market. Absolutely, yes. So, you know, touching upon what I, what I was, uh, what we initially talked about as well, like when, when it comes to downtown condos and the rental market downtown, I think these are probably the heaviest hit or the hardest hit as part of the pandemic. And it's not because people no longer want condos or, you know, people no longer need rentals. It's just we, our borders are pretty much closed. We don't have international students coming in. We don't have a ton of immigration at the, mo at the moment. So, the need for extra housing, it's not being absorbed. So basically people who are here, it's, it's a finite number and it's only so often that people will move. And, and what's, un, what's, what's really interesting is I have, I, have, I have friends, I have clients who are in rental situations where they're like, I'm paying $3,000 a month for a two bedroom condo and I can move within my building to the exact same unit for $2,000 now or $2,200. So, you know, it's just a matter of giving your notice, booking an elevator and moving a few floors and you're saving yourselves anywhere from 800 to $1,000 a month. So it, it, it's, it's, come, it's come to that point. And, and, you know, with the rental market as well, we've had this huge influx of rental units available because of Airbnb, right? Like, it, so long-term investors who were basically renting out on a short-term basis and saying, you know, I, I can make more renting properties out on Airbnb, that's no longer happening. There's no, there's hardly any demand. There is some, but very little demand for Airbnbs. So therefore those units, instead of hitting the market and saying, this is a bad time to sell, let's just opt for a longer term lease, six months, a year, whatever it might be. You've had almost, you know, eight to 10,000 extra units hit the market. And that's caused a huge decline in prices or that's caused the rental market rents to go down as well. When it comes to condos, again, my point earlier, people are realizing that if they are not necessarily location driven, then they are space driven. And for them, it's more like, it would be nice to have a designated office space. It would be nice to have a backyard. Maybe this is our chance to move, whether it's within Toronto or just like, you know, little outskirts right outside right out in, in the GTA. Maybe we can opt for that uh, freehold property and no longer be in a condo situation, even if it will come at a cost of selling our property or selling our downtown condo, not from the pre, for, not for the premium that would have been available to us maybe, let's say, six or eight months ago. When it comes to other segments, such as just Freehold itself, Freehold has always flourished and it's still flourishing, whether it's in downtown proper or in the GTA. So nothing's really changed there. Even within the luxury market, and I've had this discussion on a different podcast as well, where I've said luxury real estate is very different. It's, it's a totally different type of clientele. This clientele isn't necessarily motivated or driven by you know, a decrease in mortgage rates or, oh yeah, some mortgage rates have dropped from 2.79 on a five-year fix to 1.4 or 1.39 on a five-year fix. Yeah, sure. It's great. It's, it's a part of it, but that's not the full conversation. Whereas, you know, for some clients, interest rates and affordability, that is the full conversation. So, you know, when, when it comes to ultra, ultra luxury or just luxury real estate downtown, we're talking about three to five, three to seven, three to $10 million. Either the, pro, either the market doesn't move at all or if it moves, it's relatively where it was before because the individuals moving or the, or, 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 the, or the buyers or sellers moving around in that segment, 
they're doing it based on their needs. They're doing it based on what they require or whether they want to be on a particular street or if they want to be in a specific neighborhood. They're not necessarily moving around because, oh, the Bank of Canada or uh, one of the major banks or through their mortgage broker, they're able to get a mortgage interest rate that's completely so low that it's it's going to drive them to move at this point. So, you know, the luxury market hasn't really suffered in that regard. And and and, and most, most of these individuals, like their pockets are deep enough if they need to sit and wait, wait it out because their property hasn't sold, then they'll do that, right? Like they're, they're not, they're not in a pinch where they need to dump their home on the market and just get it sold no matter what and, and, and have like sort of a fire sale, if you will. Great. Thanks for your insight. And and just quickly on the topic of downtown condos, what would you say to somebody who's considering buying downtown condos when they're quote unquote on sale? Like, do you see them as a good investment opportunity right now because you're able to buy them low? Like I would say that it would probably make sense to buy the property, like buy a downtown condo if you're okay like holding on to it for a while. Like certainly if your strategy is Airbnb, (laughs) probably not the best idea, but if you're okay to hold on to it and live in it as your primary residence or even as a rental property and rent it out and just understand that the rent's going to be more modest. I certainly think that now could be a good time to buy. What are your thoughts on that? This is an incredible opportunity. There is an incredible opportunity opportunity to be had right now when it comes to downtown condos. I mean, like I said, just a prime example, a client of mine was just able to buy something for $65,000 off quote unquote and she's further ahead by almost $100,000. I have condos downtown that were supposed to come to market at the end of November, early early December, and we've even noticed within the pricing of those units. So if it was four or five, six months ago, I would have priced the unit for about fifty dollars to $60,000 higher. Having said that, that exact same unit is available on the market right now for fifty dollars to $60,000 off with that discounted price, and it's been sitting on the market for a month. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's a great time to buy a condo downtown. I do also feel that in the next month to two months, we will probably be at the bottom of our market. So let's say maybe January, even February. And then after that, by April, May, as the vaccine becomes more and more available and, you know, like we have more immigration we have like we open up our borders we have international students international families moving here i think the prices and everything downtown will start to recover and and you know like the reality is like right now nobody really knows what's going to happen right so as of right now people initially thought you know global pandemic we have to work from home let's just make a very permanent decision to move to move within the gta move just to the outs just outside the city and, and and get some more space because we're going to work from home indefinitely. Let's say once everything is okay and everything goes back to normal, maybe employers will require everyone back to come into the office and that will drive that move back to downtown. So, you know, it, 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 there's a lot up in the air, but I do feel that if you're looking to buy and you have the means to buy a condo now and, and you're able to hold on to it for the next couple of years, two to three years, I think this will be a great time to get in between now over the next 30 to 60 days. Well, great advice. I agree completely. Well, Rizwan, it's been great having you on the podcast today. Before I let you go, is there anything of interest that you're working on that you'd like to share with our listeners? You seem like a pretty interesting guy with your TV show. So why don't you let the listeners know what you're up to these days? Oh, it's incredible. Thank you so much, Sean. That's so generous and so kind of you to say. Honestly, like there's there's so much that I'm working on every single day, whether it's PR, whether it's, t- it's film and TV. One of the best ways to stay in contact with me is through social media because it's, it's easy. I can share parts of my life, bits of my life. So feel free to look me up on Instagram. It's Rizwan Malik. And that's probably where you'll get like the most current updated information on what's going on and what's coming down the pipeline. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. Besides being a podcast host, I'm also an independent mortgage broker. If you or anyone you know, family, friends, co-workers, or neighbors could ever use any unbiased mortgage advice or a second opinion, feel free to reach out. Email me at sean, that's S-E-A-N, at burnyourmortgage.ca or call or text me at 647-867-3711 for a free mortgage consultation. 
Also, be sure to head on over to www.burnyourmortgage.ca and sign up for my free weekly newsletter. As a small token of my appreciation, you'll be able to download my ultimate mortgage checklist on choosing the perfect mortgage. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you with all your mortgage needs. Once again, thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating. Until next time, happy mortgage burning.